Ute Indians traveled into the mountains just north of the summit that would be called Pikes Peak. By the time Colorado became a territory in 1861, this route, now called Ute Pass, was a wagon road for commerce headed into the mountains. Later, a railroad would climb this pass and use a likeness of a Ute Indian in its advertising and on its cars. By the 1880s, trains whistled up the Royal Gorge of the Arkansas River from Pueblo and up the Platte River from Denver. Ute Pass was the only entrance into the mountains between these two rivers. The fledgling city of Colorado Springs, at the foot of Ute Pass, needed a western railroad connection to tap the gold and silver of the mountain mining camps. Wagon hauled commerce quickly faded on Ute Pass as railroads blanketed the Colorado Rockies in a frenzy of construction in the 1880s. In 1881, loggers entered a mountain valley called Manitou Park, 18 miles west of Colorado Springs. A short, narrow-gauge railroad was built to move the logs to the mill. The operator of this logging show, Homer Fisher, was inspired to wish for a railroad to carry finished lumber all the way to Colorado Springs. In 1883, Fisher incorporated the Colorado Midland Railway for the purpose of building a railroad up Ute Pass to the booming silver camp of Leadville. Fisher was not the only entrepreneur who planned such a railroad. With the help of banker Irving Halbert, Fisher's group gathered like-minded investors. Halbert enlisted the aid of James J. Hagerman, a wealthy Milwaukee industrialist who had moved to Colorado Springs for a tuberculosis cure. Hagerman was the driving force behind constructing the Colorado Midland. The Midland's aspirations now reached beyond Leadville to the silver mines of Aspen, the coal fields of Glenwood Springs, and even to Salt Lake City and a connection to the Pacific. It was no coincidence that Hagerman owned an Aspen silver mine and coal lands near Glenwood Springs. Hagerman not only changed the scope of the Colorado Midland, but also its track gauge, the distance between its rails. The proposed track gauge was changed from the narrow gauge then common in Colorado's mountains to the standard gauge used by the rest of the country. This momentous decision would make it possible to carry freight and passenger cars from eastern railroads directly to their mountain destinations, an advantage that would eventually force rival railroads to follow suit. The western half of the Colorado Midland was to be constructed first. Coal near Glenwood Springs, hauled to the silver mining towns of Aspen and Leadville, would generate revenue to build the eastern half of the railroad. Competing railroads would haul the building materials to construct this western half, and they were in no mood to do so at a reasonable price. Angered over what they saw as blackmail, the Colorado Midland investors quickly raised the capital to build the eastern half of the railroad first, where construction supplies could be delivered by friendly railroads. With American and English capital, construction started in earnest, with contracts let in April of 1886. In the haste to begin construction, the railroad was badly located. High construction costs and high operating costs plagued the railroad during its entire life. On December 15, 1886, new locomotives 1 and 2, the largest in the West, arrived from Schenectady Locomotive Works in New York. The tracks reached Buena Vista by June of 1887 and Leadville by August 31st. Not one, but two narrow-gauge railroads, the Denver and Rio Grande and the Denver, South Park and Pacific, had beaten the Colorado Midland to this prize of silver mining camps. 
while the Denver and Rio Grande completed relatively easy construction to Glenwood Springs. The Colorado Midland struggled through the very heart of the Continental Divide, boring a 2,100 foot long tunnel at 11,500 feet above sea level. A tunnel reached by a marvel of loops of track spanning enormous wooden trestles. Tunnel construction had begun early, so the Colorado Midland arrived in Glenwood Springs in December of 1887, only 68 days after the Denver and Rio Grande. The 18-mile branch from Basalt to Aspen was not completed until February of 1888. Again, the Colorado Midland had lost the race to the Denver and Rio Grande. By October of 1888, the Colorado Midland had reached the coal mining town of Newcastle, a dozen miles west of Glenwood Springs. As it turned out, this was as far west as Colorado Midland tracks would ever be laid. However, Colorado Midland trains traveled to Grand Junction on tracks jointly owned with the Denver and Rio Grande, which had been forced to adopt the standard track gauge. It had cost $20 million for the Colorado Midland to become the first standard gauge railroad to cross the Colorado Rockies. Although both freight and passenger traffic were substantial, the crushing construction debt precluded reasonable profits from going to stockholders. Although the trains generated $1.7 million in revenue in 1890, only $2,500 were left over to send to stockholders. Clearly, the Midland was a poor investment. Hagerman attempted to recover his investment in the only way possible, by selling his stock in the railroad. In September of 1890, another railroad, the Santa Fe, bought Hagerman's stock to become a majority owner of the Midland, hoping that the Midland's traffic would boost its own sagging performance on its line through Colorado Springs. Although the Santa Fe had little interest in expanding the Colorado Midland, its efforts included a new, longer, and lower tunnel through the Continental Divide. Construction was begun from both the east side at Busk and the west side at Ivanhoe. Financed by investors in an independent tunnel company, the new Busk-Ivanhoe Tunnel plunged through the Rockies for one and three-quarter miles, almost directly beneath the old Hagerman Tunnel, eliminating miles of steep, snow-covered track. This old track, called the High Line, was left in place when the new tunnel was opened in January of 1894. In 1890, Bob Womack discovered gold in what would become a six-square-mile bonanza. Halbert investigated the Cripple Creek District in 1892 and recommended construction of a connection to the Colorado Midland. Not one, but three railroads would eventually be built to Cripple Creek. Railroads would arrive in the Cripple Creek District from the north, from the east, and from the south. The first railroad to reach the district came from the south. The narrow gauge Florence and Cripple Creek arrived in 1894, laying its rails through the spectacular canyon between Victor and Florence. The little line not only served the mill at Florence, but also carried passengers to a connection with the narrow gauge Denver and Rio Grande. The second railroad to reach the district came from the north, where it connected with the Colorado Midland at Divide. The standard gauge Midland Terminal and the Cripple Creek traffic it would carry were so important that the Colorado Midland delivered thousands of tons of surplus track and bridge materials to the Midland Terminal, but never asked for payment. The new Midland Terminal built south from Divide and reached the district in 1894. So busy was this line that construction to the city of Cripple Creek was delayed until 1895. The Midland Terminal shops were at Gillette near the northern edge of the district. Although not much of a mining town, Gillette's pleasures included a gambling casino, a horse racing track, and the site of the only bullfight ever held in the United States. 
The last railroad to arrive in the district came from the east. The Colorado Springs and Cripple Creek District Railroad entered the district in 1901 on a most spectacular route just south of Pikes Peak, a route particularly popular with tourists. Usually just called the short line, this last railroad was a creature of the mine owners who wanted more reasonable freight rates than offered by the independent railroads. Cities and towns sprang from the golden dirt. Cripple Creek was the main commercial and financial center of the district. Victor was a working man's town built in the heart of the mining area. Goldfield, near Victor but without its vices, was popular with miners with families. Many other small towns dotted the mountainsides. One of these, Altman, was the highest incorporated town in the world. Almost one half billion dollars of gold was extracted from the rich earth. Miners toiled as much as 3,500 feet below the surface. Some mines were served by all three railroads of two different gauges. Night and day, the freight and passenger trains of all three railroads chugged around Gold Hill. The district would include 55,000 residents, the Grand Opera House, 16 newspapers, 19 schools, 12 dozen saloons, two trolley lines, and hundreds of businesses. The Colorado Midland acquired the finest passenger cars from the very first, for it knew that passengers would find its spectacularly scenic route irresistible. The Midland also carried through Pullman cars as part of their journey from the Midwest to the West Coast. Imagine a trip on the Colorado Midland. Passengers board one of two westbound trains at the Santa Fe station in Colorado Springs. Crack passenger trains of the day were usually named the Colorado Midland train that left Colorado Springs at noon was named the Ute. Cosmopolitan Colorado Springs was founded by General William Jackson Palmer, also the founder of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. The Antlers Hotel anchors downtown, while the luxurious Broadmoor lies in the southwestern foothills. Citizens ride the trolleys, and one in five residents migrated from England. The Ute works its way west to Colorado City. Here are the major shops of the Colorado Midland. A magnificent stone roundhouse stables the iron ponies that pull the trains. Rolling stock and shop buildings are everywhere. Colorado City was the first territorial capital of Colorado, but fell on hard times until the Midland arrived. When gold was discovered in Cripple Creek, several giant mills were constructed here to remove gold from ore transported to Colorado City on the Midland and on the Short Line. A small passenger station serves the community. Suburban trains carry commuters to and from Colorado Springs, the communities of Ute Pass and Cripple Creek. Shortly, the Manitou Springs Depot is in sight. Nestled against the slopes of Pikes Peak, Manitou Springs is a vacation destination. Its mineral springs were thought to have curative powers. In 1891, the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway began to carry tourists to the summit of Pikes Peak. The Midland crosses Ruxton Avenue on a large iron structure and begins its climb through the rugged reaches of Lower Ute Pass. The Ute struggles up the steep grades of its namesake pass. Smoke momentarily seeps into the cars as the train passes through eight tunnels in just a few miles. Construction of this part of the Midland was expensive as a great deal of rock had to be moved. The shotgun exhaust echoing off the canyon walls and the labored walking pace of the train demonstrate that the cost of operating trains here is high.
10 miles west, the Ute reaches Cascade Canyon, later just called Cascade. Cascade was the first resort town built in Ute Pass. It hosts summer visitors, hot summer visitors from the plains of Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska, visitors who come to enjoy elegant surroundings and cool mountain airs. The Ramona Hotel, built in 1884, was named after a Helen Hunt Jackson novel. The Pikes Peak Carriage Road starts here, and some train passengers continue to the summit of America's most famous mountain. Not until 1907 did the Midland add dining cars to its trains. Before then, trains would stop in Cascade to allow passengers to eat a meal. The Colorado Midland passes a lake with a gazebo in its center that marks the location of the Green Mountain Fall Station. Train time sees a crowd of passengers on and off the steam cars. Vacationing visitors stay in the elegant 70-room Green Mountains Falls Hotel or rough it in the Rockies in a tent pitched nearby. Many well-to-do businessmen own summer homes here, including circus entrepreneur, P.T. Barnum. Halfway up Ute Pass, the canyon opens up into a broad wooded valley. Originally just a station stop called Manitou Park, this location developed into a town called Woodland Park. Here loggers first dreamt of a railroad up Ute Pass. Timber for buildings and cross ties for railroads are still shipped from several sawmills. Originally, Woodland Park had a large, ornate depot and eating house. This was replaced by a more modest station. The western edge of the resort district is marked by the round spire of the Woodland Hotel. Unlike the other Ute Pass resorts, Woodland Park boasts a spectacular view of Pikes Peak. At the summit of Hayden Divide, a small town named Divide came to be. Prosperity descended on this small community when the Midland Terminal was built from Divide to Cripple Creek, making Divide an important railroad and lumbering center. Ice is harvested in Colson Lake by huge saws. Stored in insulated warehouses, the ice is packed around lettuce grown near Divide and shipped to market on the Colorado Midland. Certified seed potatoes are also important to this agricultural economy, unbelievably, at an elevation almost two miles high. This is the first of three summits crested by the Colorado Midland. The Ute winds its way into Twin Rocks Canyon to enter Florissant. Before the Midland Terminal was built, People and supplies would arrive here by train to travel by wagon to Cripple Creek. Helper locomotives stationed here push heavy eastbound trains up to Divide. It is two hours since the Ute left Colorado Springs and it has come only 35 miles. Just past Lake George, another man-made lake in which ice is harvested, the Ute dives into 11-mile canyon. Its huge granite rocks prompted the railroad to try to change its name to Granite Canyon, but without success. The railroad is again perched on rocky ledges as it passes through more tunnels. On Tuesday, July 12, 1887, the First Methodist Church of Colorado Springs chartered a train to 11 Mile Canyon. The Colorado Midland used every passenger car it owned and had to borrow more to carry 500 Methodists. This event marked the beginning of a tradition of wildflower excursions that would create the most endearing memories of the Midland. From special charters to Thursday extra trains, to daily extras. The excursions finally reached the status of regularly scheduled trains. Trains stop in 11 Mile Canyon for a picnic lunch, often at Idlewild, 
and then proceed just past the canyon to be turned for their homeward journeys. Group pictures are taken. On the return journey, trains often stop between Divide and Woodland Park to allow passengers to pick wildflowers, ensuring that fresh flowers are taken off the train in Colorado Springs. On its way to Hartzell, the Ute enters South Park, a broad, flat, high valley ringed by mountains. At Spinney, the wildflower trains are turned. Cattle are shipped from Hartzell. Hartzell has a resort hotel, a water tank for thirsty steam locomotives, and a Colorado Midland Depot. Reaching the summit of Trout Creek Pass, the Colorado Midland crosses over the Denver, South Park, and Pacific Railroad on its narrow gauge way to Gunnison. The Collegiate Range and Buena Vista come into view as the Ute descends Trout Creek Pass, the second summit on the Midland. The Midland's depot is 450 feet above Buena Vista and a stage carries passengers to and from the depot. North of Buena Vista, the Arkansas River and the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad both rise to meet the Colorado Midland near Wild Horse. Helper locomotives stationed here assist westbound trains up to Leadville and eastbound trains over Trout Creek Pass. Our train arrives at Arkansas Junction, where some passengers board the shuttle train to Leadville. The Midland originally looped through Leadville, but that required an additional time-consuming climb. On April 27, 1860, gold was discovered in California Gulch. The gold camp of Oro City lasted only two years before the strike played out. In 1874, a heavy black sand that made gold mining difficult was found to contain silver. Two years later, serious silver mining began. In 1878, Leadville was on its way to becoming the richest and rowdiest silver camp in the state. Mines are everywhere, and $11 million of silver was produced in 1879 alone. Hotels shelter the traveler in Victorian elegance. Broad Harrison Avenue is lined with substantial brick buildings, including the Tabor Opera House. The Opera House provides refined entertainment to the citizens of Leadville at over 10,000 feet above sea level. The Colorado Midland Station is large and elaborate, fitting for such an important city. Miles of track serving the mines crisscross the hills east of town. The Colorado Midland has yards, shops, and a roundhouse here. A rotary snowplow calls Leadville home and is frequently sent west to battle drifts on the Continental Divide. Six hours after leaving Colorado Springs, the Ute begins its arduous climb over the highest, most difficult, and last summit on the Colorado Midland. Night is approaching, and snow might be 12 feet deep. Turquoise Lake, seen through the trees, is named for the color of its waters. At Windy Point, the train starts to climb above those trees. Across the valley, we can see the railroad's original route, called the High Line. Four giant loops of track climb to Hagerman Tunnel at 11,500 feet above sea level. Great wooden trestles once carried trains through the air. Engines once crept across Hagerman Trestle at 5 miles per hour. At 1,084 feet, Hagerman Trestle was the longest in Colorado. Snow sheds cover the tracks to protect them from the icy winters. On the west side of the Hagerman Tunnel, abandoned Hagerman Station overlooks another seven miles of descending track on the High Line. It's easy to see why the lower tunnel, the Busk Ivanhoe Tunnel, was built. The Ute descends into the inky blackness of the tunnel at Busk. Two miles farther, it explodes into the sunlight at Ivanhoe. 
The lower tunnel was started both at Busk and at Ivanhoe to speed its construction. The lake is Loch Ivanhoe, named for its resemblance to lakes in the Scottish Highlands. The Colorado Midlands Publicity Department often stages photographs at Hellgate with trains perched on this rocky shelf. The Ute continues down the Frying Pan River. Fishermen, including trainmen, use the railroad to access the excellent fishing in the area. The Midland hauls reddish sandstone from several quarries near here. Sandstone which was used to construct some of Colorado's finest buildings. Basalt is a railroad town at the confluence of the Frying Pan and Roaring Fork rivers. The trains run right down the Main Street, Midland Avenue, and most families work for the railroad. The railroad maintains extensive facilities here. Leaving Basalt, passengers glimpse a mountain sunrise behind them as their train chugs through an agricultural valley and the town of Carbondale. The Aspen branch of the Colorado Midland strikes out southeast from Basalt following the Roaring Fork River upstream. Colorado Midland trains roll into Aspen over spectacular Maroon Creek Bridge. Prospectors from Leadville found silver here in 1879. The town of Aspen was founded by 1880 and flourished as a major silver mining center. It has all the usual amenities of a wealthy mining town, including the Wheeler Opera House. Not as rough as other mining towns, Aspen is especially desirable for miners with families. Just south of Glenwood Springs, the Ute passes through Cardiff. Coal mines flourish south of town along the Jerome Park branch of the railroad. Ovens at Cardiff turn some of the coal into coke. Coke, a better fuel than coal, is hauled to Aspen, Leadville, and Pueblo. The Ute reaches the Colorado River at Glenwood Springs, a major destination for passenger traffic on the Midland. At two city blocks long, its hot springs pool is the world's largest. An elegant bathhouse was added in 1890 at great expense. Business prospered and hotels were built. The Grand Hotel Colorado opened in 1893. 200 Victorian guest rooms pamper the visitor and 40 even have private baths. A fountain graces the courtyard and a gift to Teddy Roosevelt from the hotel's maids created the Teddy Bear. Newcastle marks the end of the Midlands track and coal mining flourishes in the area. Colorado Midland trains now travel on track jointly owned by the Colorado Midland and the Denver and Rio Grande. Rifle is the most important stock loading station in Colorado. The Ute continues downstream along the Colorado River to finally arrive at Grand Junction's majestic Union Station. Grand Junction was incorporated in 1881 and prospered when the Denver and Rio Grande's narrow gauge main line arrived from Gunnison. Initially, its economy was driven by cattle. With the coming of the railroads, an agricultural economy began to develop. Fruit was grown and packed. Irrigation brought more opportunity for the orchards, which prospered and expanded. By 1905, over 1,700 refrigerated cars of fruit were annually hauled to market by Grand Junction's two railroads. The economies of Aspen and Leadville collapsed in the Silver Panic of 1893. Only the gold of Cripple Creek kept coming. By 1894, the Colorado Midland was in receivership. A committee of bondholders bought the entire railroad at foreclosure for a mere $295,000.
Restructuring its debt gave the railroad a chance to recover. In the summer of 1897, the Colorado Midland attempted to renegotiate its lease with the separate company that owned the Busk Ivanhoe Tunnel. The struggling Midland thought 25 cents per ton of freight and 25 cents per passenger to be unreasonable. By autumn, failed negotiations forced the Midland to reopen the High Line at great expense. All through 1897 and 98, the little train struggled up the Great Loops to the Hagerman Tunnel, while the Busk Ivanhoe Tunnel lay dormant, and its stockholders got exactly zero for their million dollar investment. It started to snow in Leadville on the 24th of January, 1899. Citizens of Leadville and other mountain towns were trapped as railroad after railroad was closed by train-high snowdrifts. The Colorado Midland, with its almost 12,000-foot crossing of the Continental Divide, was affected worst of all. Six locomotives struggled to push its giant plow through the mounds of snow. Two additional plows were borrowed. Hundreds of men hand-shoveled where the plow could not work. Plows and men became trapped by the blizzard. Snowsheds collapsed from the weight of the white walls of snow. Both equipment and men broke from the strain. Blizzard after blizzard attacked. The Colorado Midland was closed for 78 days. If the Midland had been able to use the lower tunnel, most of this titanic struggle could have been avoided. The tunnel company was also ready to negotiate, for it had not had any income for years. Agreement was reached and trains again crept through the Busk Ivanhoe Tunnel in May of 1899. The High Line was dismantled shortly thereafter. Both the Colorado Midland and the nation were prosperous. In 1900, the Midland would again be bought, this time by two owners, the railroads that connected with it on either end. The Colorado and Southern connected Colorado Springs with Denver and Texas, while the Rio Grande Western connected Grand Junction with Salt Lake City. Equipment and track were improved. Traffic increased. In 1901, the construction of the short line to Cripple Creek diluted the Midland's share of Cripple Creek traffic. More importantly, the Midland's arch rival, the Denver and Rio Grande, bought the Rio Grande Western, which owned half of the Colorado Midland. The Midland was now half owned by its competitor. Nevertheless, prosperity continued for the moment. nineteen oh eight would mark the beginning of the end for the colorado midland the automobile began its long slow inroad into railroad passenger traffic the denver and rio grande had completed an improvement program allowing it with the help of the rio grande western to siphon off through traffic from the colorado midland local traffic also dried up Coal mining at Cardiff declined in 1910 and ceased in 1916 when the steel mill at Pueblo developed new coal fields west of Trinidad, Colorado. The three railroads to Cripple Creek were consolidated into the Cripple Creek Central. In 1911, the Cripple Creek Central diverted all traffic to the short line, a railroad it owned all the way to Colorado Springs thus avoiding sharing profits with the Colorado Midland. The Colorado Midland was again in receivership. Traffic started to increase as World War I loomed on the horizon, but the Midland could not raise the capital to finance improvements needed to take advantage of this new traffic. Again, the Midland was sold at foreclosure in April of 1917 just before the United States entered the war. In 
it was expected that the Colorado Midland would be sold to scrap dealers. To the surprise of most, Cripple Creek industrialist A.E. Carlton bought the Colorado Midland for $1,425,000. He immediately began a $2 million restoration program that promised a bright future for the Midland. Since he controlled the Cripple Creek Central, he now diverted all Cripple Creek traffic back to the Midland. Carlton's Holly Sugar Company began to route carloads of California sugar over the Midland. Coal traffic increased, and cars full of refrigerated fruit moved out of Grand Junction. Even the plan to build to Salt Lake City was revived. By autumn of 1917, U.S. railroads were in chaos handling the traffic of World War I. By January of 1918, the U.S. government took over operation of the railroads through the United States Railroad Administration. The USRA diverted all through traffic from the Denver and Rio Grande to the Colorado Midland. The Colorado Midland was simply shorter to bureaucrats sitting at a map in Washington. The Midland was in no condition to handle that enormous amount of traffic. Besides the steep grades and snowy mountain passes, Carlton had most of the railroad torn up while he was rebuilding it. Failure meant death. For when the Colorado Midlands tracks became plugged with cars, the USRA simply diverted all through traffic to the Denver and Rio Grande in May of 1918. Without any through traffic, the Midland could not survive. It ceased operations in August. Although the war ended in November, the USRA retained control of America's railroads, and the Midland continued to slumber in Colorado's mountains. Carleton attempted to sell the Midland, and the Santa Fe almost bought it a second time. When the sale fell through, the Midland was finally scrapped starting in July of 1921. At the time, it was the largest railroad abandonment in U.S. history and would be a sign of things to come for U.S. railroads. Since the Colorado Midlands closure in 1918, the Midland Terminal had been using the tracks of the Colorado Midland from Divide to Colorado City. With the scrapping of the Colorado Midland, the track east of Divide became part of the Midland Terminal. Now, Midland Terminal trains would start their journey in Colorado City and proceed up Ute Pass to Divide, where they would return to their ancestral rails to complete their journey south to Cripple Creek. Gold mining was declining, and by the 1920s, fewer than 5,000 people remained in the Cripple Creek District. Mine ownership was consolidated as larger mines bought smaller ones, sometimes for just a few dollars. Many mines were closed. In 1923, the Midland Terminal saw its last dollar of profit until 1929, just in time for the beginning of the Great Depression. The Midland Terminal was the last railroad left to serve the district. The narrow-gauge Florence and Cripple Creek was washed out and closed in 1912. For a time, the short line was leased to the Midland, but was dismantled in 1920. Midland terminal trains still left Colorado City and highballed up Ute Pass. The elegant Ute Pass resorts were sadly dying. No longer did trainloads of summer visitors descend on Cascade, Green Mountain Falls, or Woodland Park. Certainly, few train passengers traveled to a ghostly Cripple Creek. Little was left of the greatness of this legendary mining camp. Old-timers searched in vain for one last streak of pay dirt. Passenger service ended in 1931. Travelers increasingly preferred the convenience of their own automobiles to the smoky steam trains. With the end of passenger service, the Midland Terminal was an industrial railroad carrying gold ore from the mines of Cripple Creek to the Golden Cycle Mill in Colorado City. 
locomotives became dingy with grime, and not even an echo of the elegance of the great Colorado Midland remained. After the last scheduled passenger train, the Midland carried the mail on freight trains until the post office complained about slow service. To retain the post office contract, the Midland converted two old Colorado Springs streetcars into motorized trains that would carry the mail, a few passengers, and maybe even a little freight. Life settled down to a daily ore train that left Colorado City in the evening. Crews assembled in the afternoon at the roundhouse. Each locomotive gathered some of the cars for the trip and one coupled onto the caboose. What was the fare on the, the old passenger train up here? Uh, Two dollars and seventy-five cents one way. And what was the time schedule on it? The fastest time was two hours and twenty minutes from the Santa Fe Depot to Cripple Creek. Two hours and twenty minutes, and how far was that? Fifty-six and nine-tenths miles. I believe uh, somebody also said that uh, somewhere along in that track they had about a mile a minute schedule. Where was that? Uh, that is from Cascade to a little station called Culver. Did they do it? Not very often. Three to five locomotives were needed to pull 40 or 50 empty cars to the district. There was an occasional bit of freight to be hauled in as well. Well, then you've been associated with not only this railroad, but the uh, old car uh, Midland Terminal and the, um, let's see, the short line, and what was the other one up from Florence? Florence to Gribbleford. I worked on all those roads, I also worked on the Mormon roads. What would you say you got the most out of? What way do you mean? Financially or real? <laughs> well, either one, Len. Let's see. Let's, let's go back. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to about 1903. What, what, what were you doing then? 1903, I was just starting in railroad. Uh, maybe you better explain that phrase, then. Well, I was taking care of the engines, falling through, and lining up the suburban runs in the... Uh, Triple Creek District. However, that only lasted about 30 days when I went to divide with Hawker down there for about two months. Well, let's see, was the uh, old Midland Terminal in operation then? The Midland Terminal, yes. That's where I originally started, was on the Midland Terminal, which run between Divide and Cripple Creek. It was only 30 miles long. And uh, that hooked on to the, uh, what was that, the Colorado Midland that ran up from Colorado Spring? Colorado Midland run through Divide. That was our connection point at that time. At Cascade, the train already needed to stop for water, so difficult was the several-hour climb up Lower Ute Pass. Each locomotive had to be spotted under the tank and watered. Well, how did they handle those trains at those water stops, Tom? Uh, for instance, when they had a bunch of coaches over the hill down below that they couldn't uh, see. Oh, what was those trains on? They were each engine, when he gets through taking water, he was through... Two long whistles, and uh, the next engine pulls up and takes water, and all and lo, five engines in the train have water. The fireman was waving at all the uh, ladies along the railroad, and there was a lady lifted independent. He was waving out all the time. So we put some torpedoes on the track, and the train come along up by there, they went off. The torpedoes exploded. And so we've been telling him that he'd better quit waving there because that fellow would shoot him. And when those torpedoes went off, he jumped back in the coal pile of the tank. The engineer looked around at him and said, Dad, come it, are you shot smoke? The empty train rounded the curve behind the Divide Depot. Now, on original Midland Terminal rails, the train stops for water once again at Midland before starting to climb toward Cripple Creek. The town of Gillette, named after William Gillette, an original officer of the company, had been planned as the main shops of the Midland Terminal. Gillette was always a cold place, and none of the employees missed the days when the Midland Terminal was active here. There is little left of Gillette with the decline of gold mining and the railroad shops now in Colorado City. Winding around Blizzard Point, 
the train passes Cameron and is in sight of the station lights at Bull Hill around midnight. Much of the bustle of Bull Hill remains just as in the glory days of gold mining. During the day, the Cripple Creek switch engine had been threading its way through the 25-mile maze of track in the district, gathering loaded cars to be sent to the mill. High-grade ore was once hidden away in locked and guarded boxcars. The switcher arrived at Bull Hill in the afternoon. It left loaded cars to be carried to the Colorado City Mill by tonight's ore train. Empty cars, left by last night's ore train, as well as any inbound freight cars, were moved to their destinations. The train of empties usually left Bull Hill in the middle of the night. The locomotives coupled onto the loaded ore cars and headed for Colorado City. The train made slow progress. The heavily loaded train had to be broken into pieces at Midland to be moved one piece at a time to divide where it was reassembled. I believe uh, somebody mentioned about uh, doubling a train. Now, what do you mean by that? That's where we can't uh, ha handle all of our train and we have to take half it to another side track and then come back and get the other half. That was, uh, we do that at Mur uh, between Midland and Murphy on you know, Mariner every trip. When we're handling 1,600 ton out of Bull Hill, and there's three engines, three small engines, original terminal engines, and the third engine would always stay at Gillette and wait for the train to come back. This particular morning, it must have been about 2 o'clock in the morning, Ben was sitting on the right side about half asleep, and I was on the left side in about the same condition. All of a sudden, I said, you see two fellas raise up. As we heard the most mournful wail that I have ever heard in my life, and at that time of the morning, it was, well, just a little more thrilling. And I was come to find out there was a mountain line around our engine. And that was one morning that the little 57 didn't get oiled around at Gillette. <laughs> they expected a run on the bank in Cribble Creek, and they, uh... Picked up $100,000 in Colorado Springs at the Santa Fe Depot. And, uh, they wanted the money in Cripple Creek just as soon as they could get it there. The general manager came down and told me about it. So we started out and, uh, we went from the Santa Fe Depot to the Cripple Creek District in an hour and 15 minutes. And it was something very unusual for speed in those days. Oh, was that over? That was over the old short line of the... That was on the, uh, on the short line railroad. In 1905, the Midland Terminal leased the short line, and uh, then when we all went over there and worked on the short line. The train reached Colorado City in the wee hours of the morning. A switcher would take the loaded cars, a few at a time, to the mill, returning with empties for the next night's train. This simple routine repeated for decades. The railroad in the mining district struggled through the Second World War. Once the war was over, the district reawakened. The Midland began to modernize with newer locomotives and cars. This proved to be of no value. A new modern mill, the Carlton Mill, was built right in the district, just north of Victor. The railroad was no longer needed to haul ore. Since it hauled nothing else, it was to be scrapped. In January of 1949, Midland passenger engine number 59 was cleaned of decades of grime and hauled a passenger train, the Lowell Thomas Special, to Cripple Creek. Thomas, a popular newspaper and radio personality, had grown up in Victor. On this trip, he turned the key that started the Carlton Mill and ended the need for the Midland Terminal. On February 6th at Colorado City, a trainload of railroad enthusiasts boarded the very last passenger train to Cripple Creek, sponsored by the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. 
the trip proved a bittersweet experience. Uh, we bought our last train from uh, the Carlton Mill of empties and lined them up to go down in the last train. We've been lining up these trains for some 30 years, and today was our last one. It is a very fine day in the district for the uh, closing down of the Midland Terminal. When I first went out to work on the railroad here, there was hardly a winter went by that we wasn't stuck in the snow. We bucked snow uh, as a rule from uh, October till about the, the 4th of July. And uh, what was the longest time you ever held up? The longest time I uh, snowstorm was uh, six days and six nights. And where was that? That was over at Clyde on the old short line. That time why we uh, had a short siding at uh, Rosemont. And in order to uh, make water to keep the engine alive, there was a big bank of snow on this siding. And we buried the two engines in there as deep as we could. And then we had 25 section men with us. And they shoveled snow into the tank. And the engineer and fireman put their heaters on and melted the snow. And that way we uh, melted 5,000 gallons of water. Tom, tell us about that circus train you were on that time. Uh, uh, had some uh, animals loaded in the cages. They went through the water tunnel and the cages had shifted on the cars. And they pulled the cages off of the cars. And they killed a mountain lion a couple of, and a leopard. And four or five of the animals got away. And they took an African lion that they killed and put it in the caboose. And the man come down, went in the back end of the caboose and seen the mountain lion. I think he run all, uh, the African lion, I think he run all the way to Gillette after seeing it. <laughs> Let's see, Clyde, uh, Clyde brought the engine down, when was it, yesterday or day before yesterday? Yes, yesterday he came down with, with a train from Bull Hill. That is next to the last train. Today will absolutely be the last train the Midland Terminal. Tomorrow, I'll make another trip with the inspection car to Bull Hill to clean up some detail work. And when I get in tomorrow night, that'll be the uh, end of the Midland Terminal, so far as the Midland Terminal operates. The uh, people that bought it, that's going to dismantle it, is going to start Monday morning. A few freight trains moved some mill equipment to the district, and the Cripple Creek switcher brought all the cars that could still move to Bull Hill. The last train closed all the stations as it sadly crept down the mountain. A radio reporter interviewed the crew on that last train, some of whom started work on the Florence and Cripple Creek, the first railroad to reach the district. Scrapping started a few days later. Wooden cars were burned to release scrap metal. Here, steam derrick number five meets its end. Men with torches handled the difficult job of dismantling steam locomotives. No one wanted old steam locomotives. Scrapping took just over a month as spikes were pulled from the cross ties in some of the most spectacular scenery in Colorado. Finally, the rails themselves were taken up, carted off on flat cars, and fed to the scrap metal fires of a faraway steel mill. The Colorado Midland and Midland Terminal changed the character of the part of Colorado they served. Painful week-long trips on horseback or in bucking stagecoaches became smooth, hours-long train trips including dinner and the diner. Good paying jobs on the railroad were available. Taxes paid by the railroad helped many a small community develop. The riches of Aspen, Leadville, and Cripple Creek would never have been fully realized without the trains.
passengers learn to appreciate the beauty of Colorado's mountains through the windows of the Midlands trains.